All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, hey, uh, <clears throat> three weeks ago, I started turning. And let me just say this. I broke my glasses, so if it looks like I'm a little discombobulated up here, you'll know why. That's what it is. But three weeks ago, I started turning a, a corner in our breakthrough in 2022 uh, series as we our focus turned on breakthrough in our nation. And uh, on July 3rd, I, I shared with you about uh, our historical roots as a nation, and they are biblical, and they are godly. Thank God for that. Amen? And um, I discussed many points uh, and how our founding, that day, our founding fathers uh, and the pilgrims and the Puritans and the early, about the early government fish officials, how they longed for religious freedom. Here in America, of course, as they fled a monarchy, a kind of a dictatorship, the government they left in New England, which was uh, the Church of England, you basically had to follow that or that's all you could follow. So they were mandated and dictated what they could do. There wasn't freedom in the house of God. That's never good. It's never good, church. Secondly, our founding fathers established a republic of government that rested upon the consent of the governed. Folks, that's you and that's me. And uh, that gives us entitlement to vote. And uh, we can vote people in, we can vote people out, right? And uh, it also, we have inalienable rights that were given by, listen to this three-letter word, God. Not government, God. And a third I shared was how our founding fathers knew that this type of government would only work with a moral people. It doesn't work with an immoral people because then you have chaos is what you have. And you have ultimately anarchy is what you have. In the past two weeks, I have been focusing in on our spiritual roots as a nation and how God has honored our biblical and our historical roots and has blessed us spiritually over the last four centuries. Since the pilgrims landed on the Mayflower in, in, back in December 21st of 1620, I mean, you know we have a rich spiritual heritage as well. In the 1730s and 40s, God raised up Jonathan Edwards, a pastor in Northampton, Mass. And revival broke out in his church. And, and along that same time, God raised up another man named George Whitfield who came to, from England to Georgia and went up the eastern seaboard and ended up in Mass. Uh, and he was also preaching the gospel. And uh, all, through the, all through the 13 colonies was what which, which they were called at that time. Multiple thousands came to Christ in what became known as the first great awakening. But God wasn't done yet. Over time, that ended, and once again, immorality and wickedness uh, began to arise in America. How many know when you start taking God out of the picture, what, what comes up? Immorality and wickedness, right? It's either God or it's, it's, it's that, right? How many know that when God is not in the front and center of people's lives, it will affect a nation? We see it all through the Old Testament with Israel, constantly doing this. You know, walking with God, godly king, and then God, godly king, going down, going up, all those kind of things. And we see it here in the United States of America. And any, any nation that turns its back on God, that will happen. When we get away, like for us though, when we get away from our spiritual roots of acknowledging God above all else, the fruit becomes kind of rotten. In fact, there probably is no fruit, as it always does when we, when we get away from God. We, when we get away from the vine, right? He's the vine, we're the branches. When we get apart from the vine, we're in trouble. As a nation, also individually. The, the fruit kind of starts to stink and it stops growing, doesn't it? It doesn't even grow. But God has had an answer that really kicked in high gear in 1799. It's interesting, a lot of times at the end of centuries, good big things happen in what became known as the Second Great Awakening. It started, of all places, rural Kentucky. I know we joke about people in Kentucky and West Virginia, they get married at 12, you know, the hillbillies, all that stuff. But you know what? God, God, God can move in anywhere, anytime, any place with anybody, amen? So in rural Kentucky, uh, he, they, they, which, which came out of that, the birthing of camp meetings. They were having these small meetings, and what came out of that was the camp meetings. And... Uh, this, but this renewal would spread far and wide. God raised up circuit riders who went from town to town, getting off their horse, preaching the gospel. And what would happen was churches would be started from that. And uh, awesome meetings would be taking place. Of course, the most famous we know is John Wesley. He started the United Methodist Church. That's how that whole thing got rolling because he was a circuit rider going from town to town. And there are many United Methodist churches. I call on them. I see them everywhere to this day. But as the 1800s continued, God raised up a lawyer named Charles Finney who preached all over the East Coast and saw 100,000 souls 
come to Christ. Think of that. In a, in a, in a, uh, in a six-month period, that was, in Rochester, New York, that happened. And 50,000 souls came to Christ in one week in Boston. One week. Praise God is right. Hallelujah. Then last week, the message continued on in our great spiritual heritage as we visited the 1850s in what became known as the, the layman's revival. God raised up a businessman in New York named Jeremiah Lamphere who simply invited people to pray. And pray they did. For the first half hour, I, as he was in that church, that old Dutch Reformed church, nobody showed up. And one person showed up at the end of that meeting. There were six people that came. I guess they were on African time. I don't know. Within six months, the noontime prayer meetings were attracting 10,000 businessmen who were getting saved and confessing sin and praying for revival. Their prayers were heard a year later in 1858, more than one million people were converted to Jesus Christ. And not only that, it crossed the Atlantic. It, it jumped over the Atlantic, and it went over to Europe. It skipped the ocean. The ocean doesn't need to get saved, but the people do over there in Europe. And during the later 1800s, after that, God raised up a shoe salesman named Dwight L. Moody. A dry goods salesman led Moody to the Lord in the back of his shoe store. And as the saying goes, the rest is history. Having lost his home, his church, and the YMCA that he founded in the great Chicago fire, he realized that there was something worse than all that, that someone might die without hearing the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the time of his death in late December of 1899, some people estimate his off audiences as tens of millions of people that he reached abroad and here, both. Wow. What if, but what if, that, what if that dry shoe salesman guy or dry goods salesman guy, what if he didn't lead D.L. Moody to the Lord? Think about that. Mm, we don't want to think about that, right? I said it last week, God can raise up other people, but I, I don't want God to say I had to raise up somebody else because you didn't do what I called you to do, Ken. I want to be obedient. Amen? Church, hallelujah. But you may be thinking, uh, you know, a shoe salesman who came to Christ? But nothing same, stayed the same after he gave his life to the Lord, spiritually speaking. Nothing. Only a year and ten days later, after D.L. Moody passed away in the early hours of January 1st, 1901, a man named Charles Parham received the baptism of the Holy Spirit while keeping a prayer vigil. He is considered the father of modern-day Pentecostalism. And he is considered that because he had a Bible school and... Um, and one of his students was a man named William Seymour from Louisiana. He was a son of a former slave, and he grew up on a plantation. Upon leaving uh, Par uh, Parham's Bible School in Houston, Seymour went to L.A., having not yet received the power of the Holy Ghost. Parham already had received that years earlier. And he had not received it, but while in the middle of a 10-day fast, and he and the others in his small prayer group were filled with the Holy Spirit. Word spread. How many know word spreads when God's up to stuff? I'll never forget. Yeah, well, I'll just let that go. I'll tell you later. Word spread, and people started coming until they ran out of room, and they rented an old livery stable at an uh, address that would become world famous, 312 Azuzu Street, Los Angeles, California. Whew. An old livery stable of all places in the middle of the ghetto. What happens at this dumpy little old barn-looking building fanned the flames for revival in 50 nations as people from all over the world started coming, and day and night they were having services, including many missionaries. By the time the revival ended, it was thought that it had affected every U.S. town of population over 3,000 people. Think of that. Wow. God, you're good. I don't normally give that much review, but maybe you haven't been here and you need that review, and so we're, we're heading somewhere. But God had a different plan, and we'll finish up with that today as, we, uh, as, as the 1900s moved on, God had more plans. How many know God's never done working? God is never done working. He's always up to something. Hallelujah. So if you will stand and turn to Acts chapter 2, we'll get there shortly. There's something going on 
and building up in my spirit as I review our historical and our spiritual roots. And I hope it's building a stronger desire in your heart and your spirit for revival. Hallelujah. Because I believe one's coming, and I believe it's coming soon. If God did it then, he can do it again. Our God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, it talks about in Hebrews. Hallelujah. I'm going to start with verse 14. I think I told you the chapter, yeah, chapter 2. And uh, this occurs after the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost. And so we're going to start reading in verse uh, 14. And Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all you who are in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone, church say everyone, Everyone. who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we thank you that everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, we thank you that your power that you've poured out since that day of Pentecost has not diminished. It has not gone away. It did not die with the disciples, no matter what humans want to say. It is still alive and well. In fact, I would say it's just as alive and well today as ever. And so, Father, would you just speak to our hearts today? Would you just speak to our spirits something that you want us to hear today and take forth? But like I say, don't, we don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to do what James says, be doers of the word. And so, Lord, help us to take what you're speaking and do it. And I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's children said, amen amen and amen. When you're getting seated, tell somebody, hey, get ready because revival is coming. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, glory to God. I thank God that it's not done yet. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, God did not stop moving in the early 1900s. Out, of, out from Azuzu Street, the revival, numerous Pentecostal fellowships would be formed, including the Assemblies of God, which was started in 1914. And I had the privilege in uh, 2014 to go to Springfield, the 100th year anniversary. That was powerful the stadium and just powerful move of God there as well. But something happened that day, or I think it was the second, maybe the second general council, maybe the first. Uh, our, model, our motto was uh, formed, and it's still there, of course, 108 year, years later, and it's this. I have it right on my desk, taped to my desk. We commit ourselves and the movement to him for the great, greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. Church God has answered that today. We have grown to around 70 million, and out of that, 67 million of that 70 is overseas or something close to that. Think about that. Three, three and a half million here, 67 over there. That's why we support missions. That's why we send people. The whole world needs Jesus. And there's still a lot of people that have never even heard about Jesus, like in Pakistan and Afghanistan that I talked about earlier. But not only did God raise up a lawyer, a businessman, and a shoe salesman, But in the 1900s, of all things, he raised up a major league baseball player from the Chicago White Stockings, as they were called at that time, named Billy Sunday. Now that hits my heart because I wanted to be on the Detroit Tigers. I didn't get there, guys, but that hits close to home. I wanted to be there. And fans say he was the only man who could run around the bases in 14 seconds. That's pretty quick. It's pretty quick. After getting saved, he never stopped running after lost souls who didn't know Jesus. Four years after he gave his life to Christ, he resigned baseball for full-time evangelism. He had a great physical stamina as a ball player, and it carried over long into his new career, which he preached to over 20,000 times. As a preacher, I'm getting tired up here just listening to that. 20,000 times? Seriously? Wow, that's crazy. Just in 1917 alone in New York, 1.5 million people heard him speak during a 10-week 
campaign. If my phone calculator is correct, that's what we use nowadays, right? We don't get in our calculators anymore. That's 150,000 people a week he would be preaching to. Woo! And we're talking in 1917. <clears throat> We didn't have TV. We didn't have all those things. We didn't have iPhones, iPads, IZ, UA, whatever. We don't have all that stuff then. Around 2 million people gave their lives and their hearts to the Lord during Billy's campaigns that, that spanned a quarter, over a quarter of a century. A lawyer, a businessman, a shoe salesman, a professional baseball play, player. Really? What about you? What about me? What's our excuse for not going if we, if we haven't already? Witnessing and doing what God has called us to do. I'm not getting a lot of amens, but amen, Pastor. Keep preaching it, Pastor. Keep preaching it. That's good stuff, Pastor. Oh, go, keep going, man. Even if you're the only one here, we all leave. Keep going, Pastor. Hallelujah. But that wouldn't be the last Billy God would raise up in the 20th century. There was this man named Billy Graham. And he was the son of a prosperous dairy farmer in North Carolina. He made a decision to follow Christ in 1934. Just for a trivia, that's the same year Meyer was started. Okay, I don't know why that came to my head. But at a revival meeting that was led by Mordecai Ham, after a short stint as a pastor, he decided to become an evangelist. Praise God. That was God, obviously. In 1949, while on a spiritual retreat in the mountains of Southern California, Billy decided to set aside his intellectual doubts about Christianity and simply preach the gospel. How many know we got to get our minds sometimes out of the way so our heart can do what God's called us to do? We get our minds trying to figure everything out. You don't have to figure it all out. I don't figure out how I speak in tongues. I don't figure this stuff out. I just, I just want to be God, use me. You go work through me. I don't know. Just do it, God. You're not going to figure it out. Don't try to put God in the box because every time you do, he, gets, he jumps out even quicker and he goes quicker out of there. Well, this isn't Jack in the box or Jesus in the box. No, he's not going to be put in a box. I didn't have that in my notes, but I don't know. That's for somebody. Don't try to contain God. Let him go. Amen? So in 1949, a group of, called Christ for Greater Los Angeles invited Graham to preach at their L.A. revival. And the revival was scheduled to last weekly, but word got out and God began to move. And the revival lasted six weeks with many coming to Christ. And actually, church, that was even helped on by uh, William Randolph Hearst, who liked what he was saying about communism and wanted to get him out there. He was putting him out there in papers and all sorts of stuff. And, and that helped get the gospel out. God will use anybody anytime, now, even non-Christians. I'm assuming he was a non-Christian. I don't know. But in 1957, the Billy Graham crusade in New York City was scheduled to last six weeks but extended to 16 weeks. You know, when that stuff happens, somebody's in it. It's called the Holy Ghost, right? Reaching 2.3 million people in person and by television. Wow. He could continue to fill stadiums. And in, the, in 1966, he spoke to one, actually it's one million people in London. I believe it's one million. And with the advantage of technology, of course, his crusades were televised all over the world. Hallelujah. So God was using the stadium, but he was also just piping it into everybody's living room, wherever I wanted to tune in, right? God used him to reach an estimated, think of this, 215 million people. Now, we know it wasn't all Billy. He had a team. It takes a team, church. It, it takes a team. No matter what ministry you're in, it's not the, just the preacher or the evangelist. No, it takes a huge team of people to do all that. It's not just the pastor, not the evangelist, not the whatever, Okay. I've ran into numerous people in my own life that were saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Or someone in their family was saved, and it changed in the course of their family for history. I can think of Pastor Sam Reifkog at First Assembly. His mom, I believe, was in China, she was in, and she was at a Billy Graham crusade, got saved, and that family changed from then on. They didn't know the Lord from nothing, and look how, what God did after that. You see the fruit right over there, and then the fruit isn't done yet, trust me. Hallelujah. And so she was a strong Buddhist, and, but God can break through Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, anim animism, whatever the case might be, Islam, he, it's Mormons, Jehovah's, people in Protestantism that don't know him, Catholics, whoever doesn't know him as his personal Savior needs Jesus Christ as Savior. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so Billy just simply preached the gospel, and he did. I always thought, gosh, this guy just preaches simple salvation messages. And people, millions, got saved. My Bible tells me in Romans 
chapter 10, verse 13, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But God most often uses believers to bring the good news to others. The next two verses explain how that is often done. Romans 10, 14, and 15. How then, I like this question, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching it to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, I know and I'm aware of, you know, out in the bush of Africa where people have gotten saved and they just were, you know, adoring creation. Yes, God can do that. But most often, God uses people like you and me. Okay, so he does do that. Hallelujah. God raised up Billy Graham to bring the good news to those that were wayward and to those who received this simple gospel message that is for all who believe. Only eternity will know the impact that Billy Graham and his team and all the others had on filling up heaven through the course of time. You might look at our society today and and think, ah, this is all great, PK, but uh, look where we're at now. Pandemics. We've got uh, terrorist attacks. We've got riots. We've got abortions, we've got gay marriage, we've got transgender rights, we've got claims of systematic racism, we've got the critical race theory uh, taught in our schools, and the list I could go on and on and on. There's no hope, Pastor. Oh, really? Oh, really? Let me take you back to the late 60s and early 70s in this country. It was a time of protest over the Vietnam War. I grew up with all this. I know all this. I remember all this. Race riots, rebellion over societal norms. A president was shot and killed. His brother was shot and killed. Martin Luther King was shot and killed. I remember all those things. Many young people rejected God, rebelled against their parents. Remember, we're going to tune out and tune on to drugs. And if it feels good, do it. Remember all the slogans that were going out there? They were experimenting with psychedelic drugs and Eastern mysticism and the occult religions. Things looked out of control and hopeless once again. But like I've said many times in these last three messages, but God. But God. Then the Jesus movement, Jesus revolution, revolution as it was called, hit America. Hippies and former drug addicts started getting saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. People who were once called hippies and flower children because they they feel like the flowers represented their ideals of peace and and joy and love. uh, But here's what happened. Those same people met the Prince of Peace. How many know when you meet the Prince of Peace, peace truly comes in? And now they were called, called Jesus freaks. Don't people have names for everybody? For no matter what you're going through, they got names, don't they? I remember going by one of those places in Livonia. This guy was power. This guy's ministry was known well in Livonia, Westland, and people were getting healed. And I remember my dad walked. Now I was, we weren't saved. I, I wasn't. I wasn't saved. We weren't saved. He went by there and go, "Oh, those those Jesus freaks again." He saw those hippies going over to that church. He said, "Oh, there's those Jesus freaks." I'm like, "Yeah, they're kind of weird. They bring their Bible to church. They swing from the chandelier. Those people are weird." Anybody ever been there before you got saved? Those people are weird. They bring their Bible to church. Gosh. Like I always say when I turn around in the parking lot, here, you tell me I'm going to be a pastor over here when I move to Grand Rapids, and you tell me I'm going to be a pastor in Assembly of God Church. I say, you're weird. You're smoking something. You're on drugs, man. Because those people are weird. But God. Many radicals who wanted to overthrow the government now begin to realize that the government was upon his shoulders and that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Our former superintendent of Michigan, Jeff Halavin, and his wife, Brenda, Karen, excuse me, Karen, were, were two of those former hippies. Love Jeff, he was great. That got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and healed and delivered in that whole Jesus movement. And when God moves upon a life and lives, it has a reverberating effect upon all around for good, kind of like the old stone in the pond, right? You throw it out there and it has a ripple effect, doesn't it? 
the Jesus movement opened the door for a charismatic renewal whereby Catholics and Lutherans and Methodists and Presbyterians and, and everybody of every flavor came together. We're getting filled with the Holy Ghost and meeting and signs and wonders began to happen and they were worshiping with one another. Think of that. The walls were coming down and God was moving greatly. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit began breaking down all these barriers and walls that divided people and separated them. Whether it was racial, racial barriers that were broken down during the uh, Azusa Street Revival when racism, of course, was very deep in our country in 1906. Whether it was then or in the Jesus movement when it broke down religious walls that ran deep at the time. Wow. The Bible says there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3, 28. We have a purpose, and part of that purpose as individuals and as a church, New Horizons Ministry Center, is to usher in the next great move of God. I didn't even hear an amen to that. Amen, pastor, keep preaching it, keep preaching it, even if you're the only one that believes it. Hallelujah. Whenever things appear dark, they are dark right now, and that they are now. They, but you've got to, we've got to turn to God's Word because the Bible states in Psalm 2018, You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. Aren't you thankful our God turns our darkness into light? When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went to, and lived in Capernaum to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun, and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea along the Jordan, Galilee, and the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. The next verse states, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Church, our calling is clear and has not changed. We are to fast and we are to pray and we are to preach and we are to teach and we are to mentor and we are to serve and we are to read our word and we are to worship and we are to have fellowship with one another. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's the same as it was then as it is today for hundreds and thousands of years. Let me fast forward. and We're bringing it to a close. Hallelujah. John Kilpatrick, pastor of Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida, was weary in mid-June of 1995. Leading up to June 18th on that Father's Day Sunday service, their church had been praying for revival for two and a half years. It seemed like at times it was going to go, but there was no physical manis- I mean, manifestations of that. They could, could not see it really ever break forth. He had been that pastor for many years, something like 18 years at that time, and he contemplated sending a letter to district officials in the Assemblies of God thinking, maybe it was time for me to go to another church. And he was, he was tired, and he was weary, and he was discouraged. Has anybody been, ever been tired or weary or discouraged about life or about your Christianity? It could be anything. His mom had just passed away five weeks before, and he was close to his mom because he wasn't close to his dad. And in his younger years, his mother had been beaten by his father for taking John to church. Think of that. On Father's Day, he had a guest speaker, a missionary man named Steve Hill. And he had uh, thought about, not even, uh, Pastor Kilpatrick thought about not even going to church that day because he had someone in the pulpit. But he received a letter from a young girl, as I remember the story. I couldn't find it recently, but I remember this. Uh, in the church that week that said uh, he, she was going to receive an award at the service and he decided to go to church because he didn't want to disappoint this young lady. He was a really special lady in his heart and one of the gals in his church. What he didn't know or anyone in the church except possibly the evangelist Steve Hill, he watched that opening service, I think he had a clue that day on Father's Day, I think he had a very good clue, that his life Brownsville Assembly of God, and the, ultimately the world would be changed forever by what would take place that morning. After services, Steve Hill began praying for people. John Pil- Kilpatrick, under power of the Holy Spirit, with no one praying for him, was just slain on the altar. As he was standing on the altar, he was slain in the Spirit. That means he went out. He fell on the altar and was out for four, that's right, four hours. He came to a different uh, he came a different man as the after-service prayer time changed and, uh, and it went on for hours. 
Many were touched by the power of the Holy Spirit as they were praying for people and changed. That Father's Day would begin a revival that would span five years. Reach all 50 states, 30 nations, and 3.5 million people would come through that church in those five years. 3.5 million people. Who would have thunk? Who would have thunk? Give God glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah. Multiple thousands were saved and healed and delivered and called to ministry from those meetings. In fact, when it hit first, I have a friend. He's been here, Pastor Gabe. He was saved at that very thing at First Assembly when it came there. In fact, John, uh, Lyndall Cooley and John Kilpatrick and Steve Hill came to First Assembly while I was there in 19, probably 96, day 7, somewhere in there. And I knew something was up when we got off the highway at 131. Now, uh, First Assembly is almost by Byron Center, almost three miles away. They were, they were lining up. The left turn lane was lined up to 131 to go in left at First Assembly. Three, almost three miles or whatever it is there. They probably had, they filled every crook and cranny of the church. Eight or 9,000 people were turned away. Probably could have had eight, 15, 18, 20,000. Who knows? So many people were turned away. They brought the team to just let it go. And Pastor Ben said, let it roll, let it roll. I hear about what God has done, and I know he can do it in a fresh new way. All right, I'm going to share with you a couple of testimonies from that revival before we close, and they are good, and they are good. At one point, while all this was going on, they had a hurricane. They have a lot of hurricanes in Pensacola, Florida. How many know? And the power had gone out in the city, but the power had not gone out at Pensacola. How many know the power hadn't gone out at the church? The power of God, right? Hallelujah. The church still had power. Imagine that. Well, two Playboy bunnies had come into town that day to, to uh, do a photo shoot on the beach. And because of the, because of the hurricane, their shoot got canceled. They asked the cab driver what was going on in town. What could we do in this town? And he shared with them about a church services that were happening at Brownsville Assembly of God. They agreed to go, and he dropped them off at the church. And after Steve preached, they came forward to accept Christ as their Savior. Hallelujah. Pastor Kilpatrick, like normal, would go down to the left side of the altar to pray. He walked over there normally as he did. He didn't know who these ladies were for Adam. He went over there. He started, to pray for, he started to pray for one. She hit the floor fast and started wailing like a fish. Flailing like a fish, I should say. Maybe wailing too. She was wailing and flailing, and she was just under the power of the Holy Ghost. And then the same thing happened to her friend, the other Playboy Bunny. After being in that state for some time, they both got up. When asked what they felt God had done, one of the former, notice I said former, bunnies, said, he shook the hell out of me. <laughs> Amen. You get a hold of God and he'll shake the hell out of you. Come on. I, that's what she said. I don't want my words, but that's what she said. The other said, I don't feel like the same person. My name needs to be changed. Hallelujah. Sounds scriptural to me. Our God is more than able to shake the hell and the devil out of us when we, or anyone comes to Christ. We know scripturally that there are new names written down in glory in the Lamb's Book of Life when we come to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done in our lives. The power of God began to hit the youth of Brownsville so much that as some of these young people walked down their high school, other students were falling out in the power of God. These aren't even Christians, many of them falling down, slain in the spirit in the hall. That'll, start a, that'll stir up something in your high school, right? Whoosh, slain in the spirit. Oh God, pour out your spirit once again upon all flesh. Revival, fire, fall. Fall on us now in the power of your spirit. Father, let revival fall. That was one of the songs they sang during revival. Let it fall on new horizons. Let it fall in the church of Grand Rapids, God, and church in the city here, every church, God. Let it fall over Michigan. Let it fall in this country and beyond the nations of the world, God. We need you more than now than ever, God. Oh, God, do we re need revival? And if you, we're going to bring this to a close, but if you need a touch from God today, I'm going to ask you to make your way down to this altar. Don't delay. Just come on down here. God wants to touch some people. I believe that with all my heart today. In extra special ways, he wants to touch you this morning. Don't wait. Just come. Come on. Come up. Get out of your seat right now. If God's saying you need this, you need that, you may need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You may need a healing today, a physical healing. You may need uh, a deliverance today. You may need encouragement today. You may need refreshing today. Come on. Come on down here. Be the first one. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Come on down here. Somebody's supposed to come or somebody's are supposed to come today. All of us need more of Jesus and less of ourselves. Hallelujah. Who's going to be the first? Thank you, Jesus. We're not going to, I'm, not, I'm waiting because there's people that need a touch from God today. 
and we're going to wait to those that need to come, come. And then we're going to, I'm going to pray. If you want prayer, great, ask myself, Pastor Paul. But if we're, otherwise, you just come and go after God right now. Just go after God. I know we got a dinner, but it, it'll be okay. We're going to go after and spend a little time at this altar, and we are going to go after God. I don't know what it is you need, but guess what? The King of kings and the Lord of lords knows what you need today, and he's more than able to meet all those needs. Go ahead, Karen, if you could start something, whatever God's put on your heart. Whatever it is you need today, God is able to give it to you. Hallelujah. So I'm going to be quiet, and we're going to let God do what he wants to do today. Thank you, Jesus. Then I'll come back up, and we'll have an official closing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.